threat to America. Uh, and uh, what else? What, Nikki Haley was, kept talking about he needs to take a take a, a, a test. To, well, that's yeah. what she did say. Um, but she changed her tune at the very last minute. But Ron DeSantis was tougher on him, right? Well, because he, he used said to a be, lot of but tough things. Everyone all of a sudden changed. Really? Last night at the Republican National Convention, Donald Trump's final two challengers for the nomination took the stage, giving full endorsements to the former president, calling for unity within the party and a focus on President Biden. We should acknowledge that there are some Americans who don't agree with Donald Trump 100% of the time. I happen to know some of them. And I want to speak to them tonight. My message to them is simple. You don't have to agree with Trump 100% of the time to vote for him. Take it from me, I haven't always agreed with President Trump. But we agree more often than we disagree. We need a commander in chief who can lead 24 hours a day and seven days a week. America cannot afford four more years of a weekend at Bernie's presidency. Wait, didn't we have that with all that executive time and golfing? Was that what he was talking about? Well, it's hard to say. I I, I'm so confused by, by what they said in the primary and what they said last night. J.D. Vance, of course, we talking tonight. He was the one, of course, John Heilman, who said that Christians shouldn't uh, vote for Donald Trump. Uh, but tonight, of course, that will have all changed. He also said some extraordinarily intemperate things about him that actually people like J.D. Vance are now complaining about. Uh, so it is fascinating. But uh, yeah, but Nikki Haley, uh, somebody that basically said that Donald Trump is too old and addled to be president of the United States, now offering her strong endorsement. Yeah, Joe, I mean, look, I, the, 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 the people in, the, in, in the, your former party who going back, we saw Ted Cruz and, and, and little Marco last night, too. Little Marco Rubio, who all of you have said all right, I, I, incredibly harsh things about Donald Trump. The last time there was a a real Republican convention back in 2016. You remember Ted Cruz, you know, there was a floor fight where Ted Cruz uh, was, said some of the harshest things you can imagine about about Donald Trump. This has been the story of, of the Trump era, right, where uh, people who've been either publicly or privately critical of Donald Trump and said that he was disqualified or had uh, disqualified from being president for one reason or the other, then turned around later and capitulated to him. So we've seen it for a long time. There's not anything really surprising about it. Uh, but I would say that in the, the case of Nikki Haley, it's the more it's really more egregious, I think, than almost anybody's because she, even compared to this Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantis said some critical things about Trump during the primary, but they were well within the bounds of what we have heard in both parties in nomination contests. You know, your people, you know, Kamala Harris criticized Joe Biden back in, in 2020. Uh, but, but Nikki Haley was different. And, and you guys remember, I, I, you know, I was out there with her uh, in, in Iowa, in New Hampshire, in South Carolina, uh, where her criticism of Trump got harsher and harsher and harsher. And we talked about it a lot on this show. Nikki Haley had found her voice. She was taking a stand. She was going as far in some respects as, as people in the Democratic Party were to say that Donald Trump was reporting the way that he behaved in a room with Vladimir Putin. You know, she said that things that were not merely critical, but that were uh, the kinds of things that Democrats uh, say about Donald Trump. And the question of what of what she was at heart uh, was on the table. And, and I think there was always a school of thought, which was ultimately Nikki Haley is all about Nikki Haley. She wants a future in this party. Eventually, she will endorse him, people would say. And others would say, no, I think she's really changed. She's found her voice. Well, yeah. we found out uh, last night which Nikki Haley, well, who Nikki Haley really is. So uh, let, let's just go through some of these. I just to just. Uh Looked at some old articles here, Caddy. Um, Nikki Haley uh, told the Wall Street Journal that electing Donald Trump would be, quote, suicide for our country. She called Donald Trump unhinged. She questioned Donald Trump's mental fitness and demanded that he take a cognitive test. 
And here are a couple of other highlights or lowlights of of her campaign against Donald Trump. Of course, many of the same politicians who now publicly embrace Trump privately dread him. They know what a disaster he's been and will continue to be for our party. Donald Trump can't win a general election. She, wow. Caddy, it's, it's <laughs> almost like she's Karnak the mu- uh, magician and she can like predict the future because she predicted her own future mm. right there. After saying electing Donald Trump would be suicide for America, after saying he was unhinged, after saying he wasn't all there and he needed to take a cognitive test that he was too old to be president of the United States, she said, you know, and some Republicans will say this that worked for him quietly, but then they'll go on to support him. Nikki Haley, meet Nikki Haley. Mm, that Yeah, that February comment is the particularly telling one. It does represent, you know, everything we have heard over the last what, however many years it's been, almost eight years of Donald Trump, all these Republicans who seem to be afraid of him and have grown increasingly afraid of him because they think that if they don't get his endorsement, they won't be elected or re-elected. Uh, and Nikki Haley, you know, at the end of her campaign, we all noticed it, seemed to have become a much more agile political athlete, much more confident of her own voice. And we saw her there last night vaguely trying to thread the needle of saying, well, I don't actually always agree with him. I'm not one of those people who I said I was, who I criticized so roundly, who says one thing about Donald Trump, but feels another one, because here I am saying that, you know, I don't always agree with him. But the way, the the astonishing thing about this Milwaukee convention is the way that Donald Trump has just managed to align the party under his vision and auspices. I don't know what percentage of people are there in Milwaukee who don't love Donald Trump, but I'm not sure that Nikki Haley really does represent the majority of the Republican Party anymore. They they have fallen in lockstep with him. Now, of course, this is the crowd that adores him, but the people who are speaking one after the another, maybe they don't like him in private, but you get no sense of that. This is a party that has fallen fully under Donald Trump's thumb. Uh, Mike, you and I stood in New Hampshire on the eve of the primary there in a ballroom listening to Nikki Haley. And as John said, it's not unusual for candidates in a primary who criticize somebody to fall in line and support the nominee. But the criticism was not on policy. It was that Donald Trump is diminished. She compared him to Joe Biden, said that he's just not the same guy he was when I worked in the administration, said he had become more unhinged even than he was before. And the line she kept using over and over was, Don't blame me come November if you nominate Donald Trump. He's going to lose to Joe Biden. Don't come crying to me. And now here she is on stage giving a full-throated endorsement last night at the convention. You know, when she spoke that night, uh, and we were there, as you indicated, in in New Hampshire, uh, I don't think she realized then and probably still doesn't realize now what an outlier she is within what used to be the Republican Party. I mean, the Republican Party, its brand is now Donald Trump and has been, I think, for quite some time. And, Jonathan, you talk to people in Washington all the time. There has to be an awareness that this is not only unique in this century, it's unique maybe in American political history, that one individual, Donald J. Trump, has so managed to come in from the outside, from the business world, and completely co-opt, take over, one of the two major political parties in the country. He has taken over the party and he has completely reshaped it. Evidence of that, his running mate, J.D. Vance, who is now seen as sort of the MAGA heir apparent, very much of the Trump cloth. There was no effort to moderate here. There's no effort to appeal to a different part of the party. This is pure... Trumpism, and we saw it on display. I mean, he is, of course, beloved there in Milwaukee to the point where a couple dozen rally uh, uh, convention goers were seen with bandages on their ears to sort of pay tribute to Donald Trump and his wound that he suffered what happened on Saturday. What I think is interesting about Haley, though, is we, we heard uh, her say that, look, I disagree with some of, of Donald Trump, and she tried to create this permission structure. You can disagree with him, but still vote for him. But it wasn't that long ago. The Republican primaries, well after it was clear that Trump was going to be the nominee, there were still Republicans primaries where size percentage of voters, uh, Willie, were Republican voters were still not voting for Donald Trump. Right. They were voting for Nikki Haley or making some sort of protest vote. And it's not clear if those voters will come to Trump. Some of them 
during the primary process seemed very open to, to President Biden. And even if Haley is saying, hey, we should get behind him, it's not clear that they will, particularly since Trump himself has made no effort, zero, zero effort to try to win them over. Yeah, you're right. They, Nikki Haley was getting lots of votes, Mika, after she had dropped out of the race, long after she had dropped out in some cases. But there was, it's a, it's quite a, an image last night, quite a tableau that we're seeing there in Milwaukee where Donald Trump yeah. walks into the hall, sits there and watches this parade of candidates who criticized him in very, very personal ways, uh, calling him perhaps a suicide mission, as she put it into the Wall Street Journal for the country. If he's reelected, saying he's unhinged, saying he's diminished, all these things, watching them come to heal and to support Donald Trump. And in the case of Nikki Haley, as John says, the hope on the Trump campaign is that she can bring with her those people who are skeptical of Donald Trump, perhaps some of those suburban women who will decide the election. Right. Uh, well, we'll see what happens there. Three sources tell NBC News President Biden is getting ready to endorse significant reforms to the Supreme Court. The president is weighing legislation that would establish term limits and an updated code of ethics for justices. Any reforms to the high court would require congressional approval, which remains unlikely given Republicans' control of the House and Democrats' inability to break a 60-vote filibuster in the Senate. Joining us now, White House reporter for The Washington Post, Tyler Pager. He was part of the team for The Post. who were first to report this story. Tyler, what more can you tell us? Good morning, Mika. Thanks so much for having me. And that's exactly right. This is a significant shift for the president, long an institutionalist chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who has resisted calls from members of his own party to endorse reforms to the Supreme Court. We're expecting him to formally back some of these changes, you know, in the coming weeks. Um, and, and I think you know, it's obviously faces long odds of, of being enacted, would need congressional approval, but it still shows the, the, the way in which the Supreme Court has transformed its public identity over the last few years. Biden resisted these calls in 2020 when running for president. He told Democrats if he was elected, he would institute or bring together a Supreme Court commission to study some of these proposed reforms. They wrote a nearly 300 page report. And then that was it. He didn't really act on it at all. But as we've seen the Supreme Court move further to the right, overruling Roe v. Wade, um, this decision on Trump's immunity, we've seen its public reputation and, its, and Americans' approval of it decline. And we've also seen the president become more critical of it. And that has led us to this point where we're expecting him to finally, Democrats have long awaited for him to do this, throw his support behind some of these reforms. And Tyler, because they haven't gotten the decisions they wanted over the last several years, many progressives have called for an expansion of the number of seats on the court. The president stopped short of that here. Um, but to what extent is this symbolic in many ways, given the threshold that we just laid out, that you'd have to get 60 votes to do any of this and, and two thirds actually to get constitutional amendments on some of these things. So uh, that's unlikely, uh, given the way our, our Congress is, is divided right now. Um, so is this sort of a symbolic signal to the progressive base in an election year? Yeah, absolutely. This is not we're not going to see the president come out in support of court expansion. That is one idea he has long been opposed to and remains so um, worried about what that would mean going going ahead. But this is absolutely a symbolic measure, something where he wants to signal his views on the court. Um, we are obviously just, you know, a few months away from an election. And this is often a time when we see presidents or uh, major party political candidates roll out new policies or signal their support. But I do think it is still significant that the sitting president of the United States is poised to call for these, these reforms, particularly term limits, would be a monumental change to the workings of the Supreme Court, and, and obviously still has long odds of passing uh, Congress, but still a huge shift for Biden and for the country as they change their opinions of the high court. Um, you, you know, the uh, and the United States may be I believe it's one of the only Western democracies, if not the only Western democracy, uh, that does not have term limits right. for their Supreme Court <clears throat> justices. Uh, there, there just usually is, and um, so, and and as far as reforms go, Mika, right now, I, you know, I, I, I great reverence for the court. I have great reverence for. Uh, the federal judiciary, mm -hmm. I think it, it, it continues to act as a leveling wind, even though we 
we may not agree with with everything that that comes down the the pike. But that said, right now uh, the Supreme Court standing with the American people's fallen to. Oof. A, a, a record is, low. Yeah. Their credibility is shot. They're seen as a political institution. A lot of this comes because of the Dobbs ruling, a 50-year president, a 49-year president that about 65, 70 percent of Americans did not want overturned. You take on top of that Clarence Thomas and all of the other uh, issues that have been happening as far as uh, you know, people finding out that these Supreme Court justices just sort of live by their own ethics rules. There's, there's, there are no guidelines whatsoever. And so the numbers are really getting knocked down. So an a idea like this, which may have been very unpopular 10 <clears throat> years ago, probably because of the lack of discipline by some of the yeah. justices on the court and how politicized they and their families have become, Unfortunately, uh, it, it cast a, a bad shadow for the Roberts court. So something like this may actually connect, yeah. not just with progressives, but with a lot of Americans. A lot of ugliness politically. Um, and the Dobbs ruling having an immediate and uh, searing impact yeah. on the lives of women across America. Well, uh, and, for everyone and, to see. And, and uh, an immediate sort of jolt to American politics in yeah. a way that has damaged those who have pushed for for uh, restrictions on women's access. Taking away 50 years yeah. of freedoms. Yeah. All right, so still ahead on Morning Joe, Democratic Senator. I don't think they can win with Joe Biden. I think the only way is to is to find a way for him to say, I'm not running, and to replace him at the Democratic Convention in August and hope to God that that gives him a shot. And I frankly can't see how he can he can recover from the kind of sentiment that, that is out there. It's not new. And it's only been made worse by the events of the last couple of weeks. The, the president, President Trump has been seen as the stronger of the two men for over a year. And then on Saturday night, in that iconic moment, when he struggles to his feet, pushes his way through a scrum of Secret yeah. Service agents yeah. in order to, with blood flowing down his face, raise a fist as, a man, as an act of defiance and reassurance to the crowd. You saw how the crowd reacted that, that evening. Longtime Republican strategist Karl Rove with that analysis yesterday on Fox Business. As the Republicans present a united front at their convention this week, Democrats remain fractured. A group of House Democrats want the DNC to delay its virtual roll call to select the party's presidential nominee. The DNC plans to hold the vote as early as July 21st, initially moving it up to ensure the party meets Ohio's deadline to certify the presidential ticket. But Ohio lawmakers changed that deadline, pushing it past next month's Democratic convention. Now more than 20 Democrats have signed a letter saying the early virtual roll call is not necessary, citing growing concerns over the president's campaign. You know, and um, yet. <laughs> yeah, no, this is what's so, so interesting. Um, Mike Barnacle, I'm going to show you some polls here. Um, because, you know, my feeling, Mike, is if they just want to say that Joe Biden is too diminished and he needs to step aside, then just say that. But instead, they go, oh, the polls. He's, I, you, you and I have heard this. Oh, the polls are so bad. He's, he can't win. He can't win. It's impossible. There are 110, 111 days left in this election. At this point in 88, Michael Dukakis was what, 15, 16, 17 points ahead? Mm. Uh, at this yeah. point in 2016, Hillary Clinton was going on Saturday Night Live laughing and mocking Donald Trump and talking about how lucky she was to have drawn Donald Trump as her Republican opponent. And everybody, everybody, but I say a few of us, uh, said there's no way Donald Trump could win. No way. Everybody. Go back and look at the tape. Uh, in 2020, uh, Joe Biden was supposedly up by 10, 12 points in Michigan and Wisconsin a couple of days beforehand, led me to saying I trust no polls. It ended up being very tight. In 22, we heard about the red wave that never materialized. I mean, it's such BS. I, 
really want to use a, a stronger word. Everybody goes, oh, well, I, I was the only one that was saying there wasn't going to be a red wave. Really? No. Really? Oh, I knew Donald Trump was going to win in 2016. Really? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Because we were mocked and ridiculed repeatedly for saying that Donald Trump could win in 2016. In 2022, everybody was talking about the red wave. And we we're I just don't see it. Now we hear from Democrats on the inside, see also Obama uh, supporters, um, saying there's no way he can win. He's down so low. It's all over. Well, here's the latest morning console poll taken on Monday, taken on Monday. Last week, before the tragic assassination attempt, Donald Trump was up by two points. On Monday, it's just a snapshot. Donald Trump up by one point. According to a single day survey, Trump leads by one point among registered voters nationwide. That's about 2,000 uh, plus registered voters, so a pretty good sample size. That's within the margin error. In a poll conducted over three days last week, of course, Trump led by two percentage points. So, uh, it's a one-point race. Again, just a snapshot. But here, here's the deal, everybody. If you're looking at this, don't look at the margins. Look at the fact that it's a tie. This race is tied. Another snapshot poll, this one conducted yesterday, also shows November's election up for grabs. In the latest Reuters Ipsos National Survey, Donald Trump leads Joe Biden by two points, 43 to 41 percent among registered voters. Again, a tie. Now let's go, because people say, oh, well, in the battleground states, he's losing by 87 points. Oh, oh, we must do something, David Axelrod says on CNN. Oh, there's no way he can win, says the pod bros. Oh, it's all over. Well, OK, so let's go to what is probably his weakest swing state, Georgia. A Fox 5 Atlanta and insider advantage survey is Trump leading by three points in Georgia over Joe Biden, 47 to 44 percent among likely voters in the uh, swing state. That's Mike. That's that's about as close as Georgia has been over the past several months. And in fact, a CBS poll that was out this weekend showed again a tie. It was a two point lead by Donald Trump over uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, in Georgia, which again, I saw six, seven, eight points about a month ago. Now, let's look for a second at what's happened. Of course, we talked about the tragic assassination attempt uh, and, 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 and the tragic killings at his rally uh, in, um, in Pennsylvania. Um, we've talked about that. We, we, we've talked ad nauseum about Joe Biden turning in the worst presidential performance ever in the history of televised debates uh, before that. You know, uh, these same people that are saying he must go were telling me he's going to be down 10 points. I have it on good authority that he's going to be down 10 points in all the polls that are going to be coming out. I have it on good authority. It ended up being like three, down by three points. Um, we had the Lester Holt interview. Everybody calling me, oh, well, that's the end. Did you see? He mumbled like Chewbacca at the end. He says, that's the end. It's all over. He's, we're not going to like Chewbacca. It's done. It's done. We had the press conference. Oh, he said President Putin instead of President Zelensky. Oh, he said Vice President Trump. It's over. It's done. People factored all this in, Mike. They factored it all in. Joe Biden, I got bad news for them and for Joe Biden. Joe Biden wasn't good at talking in 1987. He has a stutter. When he was humiliated <laughs> and driven from the okay. race in probably one of the most humiliating endings to a presidential campaign imaginable. 2008, not much better. The gaps on the campaign trails, the things that made staff members go, ay, 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 what's <laughs> going on with this guy? So, so people know Joe Biden. They factored this in. People know Donald Trump. They factored this in. Now, all this could change in a week. Who knows? But right now, as we said yesterday, we live in a 46-46 country, not a 50-50 country. We live in a 46 46 46 country. 
And the Democrats have got either fish or cut bait. Like if they can't drive Joe Biden from the race, they need to line up behind Joe Biden because there's no middle ground here. You're either united, you know, a house divided against itself can't stand. You're either united or your side loses. They've got to make decisions fast. And all these stories about Nancy uh, furiously going around trying to undermine Joe Biden, it's not working. I mean, I don't even know if that's true. We keep hearing about Barack Obama and all of Barack Obama's people quietly working behind the scenes to undermine Joe Biden. If they are. That's not helpful. It's not helpful, first of all. And secondly, it's not working with the rank and file base. After all of these historic moments and Republicans are in Milwaukee, they know they're going to win. Just like, you know, Coral Rove said Joe Biden can't win. I understand he's turned in some a terrible debate performance. He has trouble in interviews. He always has. But again, I want to see the polling that says that. I like I, I want I want to see the numbers that say that because all I hear is oh, 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 oh there's a secret poll. Oh, 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 I've looked at internals of candidates and he's down by 87. Every public poll that's come out has this race tied, Mike, even after two of the most historic events in recent American political history. Yeah. You know, Joe, I I don't know what to believe in terms of polls now, right now, given the volatility out there in this country. I mean, the country was truly shaken to its core over the weekend. Uh, That's a given. And each and every day, it seems something happens in everyone's lives that cause them to look at our politics and say, oh, geez, I'm going to stay away from that. But with regard to Joe Biden, I was watching him speak in Las Vegas yesterday, and he clearly is going back to an old proven route for Democrats. He's talking about issues where people live and talking about what's going to happen if there's a change in administration if the Trump administration, the Trump-Vance administration succeeds him, and the losses that people will endure, and losses in terms of what's going to happen to Social Security, what's going to happen to Medicare and Medicaid, what's going to happen to the civil service function in this society where independent people go to work in each and every day for the federal government, what's going to happen to clean air, clean water, food, regulatory agencies that protect the public uh, and make the public lives more safe, allowed to live more safely because of rules and regulations that are put down. What's going to happen to billionaires? Are they going to become double billionaires or whatever they call themselves, trillionaires, when they make even more money? What's going to happen to the tax code with another tax cut provided by the Trump administration next January or February? What's going to happen to people's lives on a daily basis? How much is the ordinary American going to lose under an incoming Republican administration? People who live on the margins, people who live paycheck to paycheck, what's going to happen to their lives? Are they going to be better off under a Republican administration? A proven, proven commitment to rich people in this country, proven, as opposed to a Biden administration and sort of an old combination of FDR, Harry Truman, JFK, LBJ stuff. What's going to happen to people? That's the question that Joe Biden has to answer. That's the question he was pushing yesterday in Las Vegas, and he didn't look bad. And, you know, John, yesterday at that Mm-mm. speech in Las Vegas to the NAACP, he said, I'm all in. Again, he can't be more clear where he's coming from. He sent the letter to Congress. Even after that, members of Congress said, we need an answer, make a decision, to which he said, I've made my decision. I'm all in. He reiterated that yesterday. Those national polls are neck and neck. There has been some slippage, but still mostly within the margin of error in those battleground states. Trump has definitely made up a little ground, but my gosh, those are all winnable, the Biden campaign would tell you. I think what people are seeing, though, is not the gaffes of Joe Biden of the past. They're seeing gaffes as a result of age. And there are concerns, and polls show this, even within the Democratic Party. Is he up for the job? But as Joe says, make up your mind. If he's too old for the job, just say that. But you got to point to some data that shows he can't win if you're saying he can't win. Right. And polls well before the debate show the Democrats thought he might be 
too old, and that's only increased. But the, it can't be said enough. Polls show this is a pretty static race, and it just seems so premature that there were pundits on Saturday night or Sunday in the wake of that shooting saying, that's it, the race is over. We have this image, this defiant image of Donald Trump, his you know, fist raised, blood on his face, game over. And it's clearly not. This is still a tight race. Now, the Biden team has work to do still. They know that. And that includes fending off voices within their own party. First of all, we're seeing the president go at the coalitions. Last, yesterday's event was about black voters, the NAACP. Today, he's got an event squarely geared at Latino voters. The Supreme Court push that we detailed earlier in the show is a nod towards progressives. It came, of a, came from a call he had with them in the last few days. He's trying to shore up his base of support because there are still some Democratic lawmakers out there who want to try to see a change in the ticket. And Joe, that's why there has been real fury in the last day or so about about this plan from the DNC to move ahead with this virtual roll call, which many Democrats say, hey, yeah, it was needed when Ohio was trying to game the system and, and, and keep them off the ballot. It no longer is because the state pushed off that deadline. And to the Democrats who are opposed to Joe Biden, they feel like rushing this through silences that debate. The Biden team answer is simply saying, this is the plan, we're staying with it, and listen to the president, he's not going anywhere and he can still win. He's not right. going. He's not going anywhere. He's not. Let, let me say again, the, the day after the debate, I said he needed to consider stepping down. I said, let's wait a couple of days, see what happens, see where this goes. If everybody was right, he was going to lose 10, 10 points or if his family and him got together and decided he wasn't up to the job, he needed to step aside. Well, the guy with 14 million votes from Democrats in the primary said he's going to stay. And I know that may make some people that worked in the Obama administration angry. I understand that. They didn't like him when he worked in the Obama administration. It's the stories I could tell. But I won't. Hmm. I mean, he says he's staying in it. We don't know what's going to happen. He may have another incident, right? But... He's got the 14 million votes. He's got about 90 percent of the delegates. He's decided he's going to stay in the race, even after the worst debate performance of not only his life, but of, uh, that any of us have seen in our lifetimes from a major presidential candidate, even after the tragic uh, uh, assassination attempt this weekend, uh, even after Donald Trump's uh, heroic response to that, uh, even after all that, we're still a 46-46 nation. And you can whisper to everybody and you can call all the big fundraisers, you can call all your billionaire friends and say, don't give Biden any money, which is what's going on right now. Call all those billionaire friends you want to call all of the most powerful people and, you know, in politics and the media and try to push the guy off the ticket. You can do that. You've been trying to do it now for three weeks. It's not working. He's saying he's not going anywhere. And if you look at the poll numbers, he, the, the people who actually answer these polls, who aren't elitist billionaires in Silicon Valley or in the media or uh, in Washington, D.C., are on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Those people are saying, you know what? We're good with a guy from Delaware. We're good for, with a state school guy. We're, we're good. That's what they're saying right now. Again, Politics is fluid. It could change tomorrow. It could change the next day. The only thing I'm striking back against here are people saying it's over. There's no way he can win. Well, it's not <laughs> That's helpful. just 110 days. Under, and the only thing we can, that they're doing, as I said a couple days ago, Democratic pollsters are saying the only thing they're doing is they're hurting Joe Biden with some Democratic voters who hear this from Democrats and then pull away from Joe Biden. So MAGA Republicans are a lot of things um, that perhaps uh, some Americans fear in terms of the future of our democracy, but they are unified. And that is something that the Democrats are not. And it, it's, you know, when that debate performance happened, many like you said, let's see what happens. Let's give it a week. Let's see. And the two things that people were focused on was performance and polls. So let's think about that. The polls haven't really moved, right? So if you think about it, after that debate performance. Kind of have tightened up in, After in that ways, debate performance. I don't know how that happened. Okay. It was so, a horrible debate. It was just but miserable. Then the president, I mean, I, I can only name a few because he's been on the road since proving himself, but that NATO news 
news conference, which went well past 8 p.m., so mm. nobody can make those uh, yes. snarky comments, uh, especially those on the Trump side watching a presidency that Trump had where he didn't do a lot of work uh, daily. Um, but the NATO news conference showed the depth of his dynamic knowledge around the world as he took reporters on I mean, the response, to every the response, region around the world. The response to David Sanger, uh, please give me transcript, any transcript from any Donald Trump press conference while he's president of the United States talking on foreign policy and match the transcript and the knowledge, the working knowledge up between Joe Biden he and also, Donald Trump. He, he confused order two. By the way, it's very funny. David Axelrod a couple nights ago was going through what when Joe Biden spoke on Sunday night, he he cut a word off. And David Axelrod, of course, had to bring that up and then got and, someone's name wrong. and then got somebody's name wrong. So I mean, I've does, seen David, that. does David Axelrod need to get off of TV? I mean, this happens. <laughs> Media people keep going, oh, Joe Biden confused names. Then they throw to somebody and they confuse a name. We know we do that. But then he also in that news conference talked about his uh, time in the Senate yeah. and how that experience has led to his ability to pass historic bipartisan legislation at a time like right now, where you would think you couldn't get anything through. Right. So then after the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, he held a, a, a message to the nation from the Oval Office telling people to bring the temperature down. I mean, he's doing everything right. He's doing events across the country. Crowds are screaming, we have your back. The question is, are Democrats going to have him back? One Democrat, Barack Obama. Because if former President Barack Obama would step up and get behind Joe Biden, that would stop all of this and that would make all the difference. And it seems right now that after everything that has happened, it, it seems that that unity is more important than ever, ever because the Republicans, Trump Republicans, are going to steal that unified message right. from the Democrats. You know, right now it is a it's a choice. It, right now it is a choice. Um, maybe a couple of weeks ago there was an idea because everybody was calling, getting the telephone um, and talking about a brokered convention, an open convention. That was the dream uh, or talking about Kamala Harris. Um, or talking about, you know, Josh Shapiro, that was the dream. That's not going to happen uh, unless, unless something really dramatic changes. Joe Biden keeps telling people, he told Lal Sharpton this weekend, he told Lester Holt, he keeps telling everybody, I'm not leaving this race. And if that's the case, then this race is very clear. It's a choice between Donald Trump and J.D. Vance running the country over the next four years and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So uh, 110 days left, a lifetime in American politics. But at some point, said it last week, Democrats have to come together. They just have to come together unless they want Donald Trump and J.D. Vance controlling Washington, D.C., uh, and changing the way Washington works for the next generation. John Heilman, curious about your thoughts, because I know you've heard the same thing I've heard. Oh, the, um, the donors, it's all dried up. Oh, people are calling, saying, you know, it's all over. It's all over. Um, I, I'm curious your, your, your take on all of this uh, as we look again at polls that have essentially showed this race to be a dead heat, at least the public media polls. Well, I, Joe, I, I guess I'd say two things, and, and um, w one of them is that there's a dimension in the polling, which is public, uh, that, that in the discussion you guys have been having so far you haven't talked about, and I think it's one where, and again, uh, I'm not advocating a position here, I'm, I'm just reporting what, what, uh, sure. what Democrats, fellow Democrats of the president, uh, the, those who are concerned and see a, bla a darkening picture, what they point to. They, do, they, they acknowledge what you've just been saying, which is that the, the floor has not fallen out under Joe Biden. The polls are still margin of error, uh, certainly at the national level and in the battleground states as previously determined, what we talked about as the battleground states. I think the dimension that's missing here and that a lot of Democrats would talk to and you talk to you about is that there are now a bunch of states in play that weren't in play before. So you can see this in the public polling, New Hampshire, Virginia, New Mexico, Colorado, you're starting to see the battleground map is now expanding and it's expanding hey, in John. a way that's not helpful.
to the to the Biden campaign. Yes. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Virginia uh, were already slipping and were already in play before the debate. Going into the debate, those three, we had already seen this sort of slippage. So again, they can say we made a terrible mistake picking Joe Biden as Democratic nominee, if that's what they believe, because he's not strong against Donald Trump. But what they can't say is that those states are slipping because of his debate performance or anything that's happened since then, because those numbers were going south even before the debate. Well, I think I, that's true in some cases and less true in, in others. But I'll, I'll say that is a this is a concern, right? And when you think about where the locus of the concern is, it's it's congressional Democrats who are worried. And I'll, I'll, I will say well, a person whose name has not been uttered so far on the show, uh, who uh, mm-hmm. J. Mar Jonathan Martin reported uh, in Politico this week that Nancy Pelosi, who who is still, according to to, to Jonathan Martin's reporting uh, and other reporting, is still working the phones. Uh, and is working the phones in a way that's doing what you guys are talking about here that you think is deleterious. She seems to be convinced that the situation is deteriorating. And Nancy Pelosi has a pretty good feel for for politics and for polling. And, And again, I just say this is what if you talk to congressional Democrats, what they are worried about, they're worried now about losing the House. And they're worried about the notion that the battleground map is expanding, not contracting, uh, that this is what Republicans here in Wisconsin uh, here in, in Milwaukee are talking about is that there are more is so sp- spreading the field out. And this is where the donor situation comes in, Joe. And again, I'm not ar- arguing for what's right or wrong here. But if, if it is the case, and this is something that even people inside Biden world will acknowledge, if large dollar donors decide that they're going to close their checkbooks, not write do- checks right. to, Donald, to, to Joe Biden, he can still rely on small dollar donors and get about halfway to what the numbers are that they needed. But if large dollar donors decide, you know what, we need to save the House, and they start just to direct, redirect all that money, this was a campaign that was relying on both grassroots dollar, low, low dollar donor donations and on high dollar. If the high dollar all moves mm-hmm. over to the House, that's going to be another right. significant constraint on Joe Biden's ability to, con- to, to compete. Yeah, and, and if the high dollar donors decide to, the elites decide to leave Joe Biden, is, well, I, I, I guess they're going to be contributing either directly or indirectly to J.D. Vance and Donald Trump, because that's, that's what happened. Again, John, every one of those points, legitimate points, they've been legitimate points for the past three weeks. And Joe Biden has said he's not leaving under any circumstances. And so, Mika, at this point, I'm wondering, do they want to keep complaining or do they want to start winning? Yeah. It's, you, you can't that, do both. You can't complain. Question. You can't whine. You either follow however flawed uh, they consider him to be. You follow the quarterback uh, in the huddle or you don't.